Welcome to Corporate Governance at LSE. My name is Tom Kirchmeier and I have with me today Gary Greenberg, who is Head of Emerging Markets in Hermes Investment Management. Gary, what are the big issues in emerging markets in terms of corporate governance? Well, there are some very big issues. Corporate governance is one of the things which can make or break investments in emerging markets. And corporate governance actually has a relationship with national economic models, as well as whether it's a family or a government company. So these are very important things that investors really have to keep an eye on. And do, do you think they do? Investors are very concerned, uh, especially about corporate governance because it can make the difference between making money on a stock and losing a lot of money on a stock. So understanding the reputation of the management, their track record in terms of capital discipline, and also in terms of uh, treating minority shareholders is very important. And we've seen some big issues over the last couple of years. But all these issues have been debated in the UK or other developed nations. What really is different between emerging markets and de more developed capitalist economies? Well, I, maybe what we've got in emerging markets is premature capitalism, where companies have uh, issued shares to minority investors, to international investors, before really understanding what the demands of those investors will be. And so we've got conflicting duties and conflicting objectives, which in many cases can cause a problem. Who is winning in a way? Is it the investor or is it the firm? Well, in the best case, both of them win because management uh, understands that it's got a duty of care towards its providers of capital, both the family, the state, or institutional investors or retail investors. And managements that understand that will manage the, the business in such a way as to take care of everybody. And that's entirely possible. But in many cases, those, those different uh, stakeholder groups have, uh, have interests that are very difficult to reconcile. For example, in China, many companies are listed that are effectively village or township or provincial enterprises, and they have a duty to employ lots of people, which is not necessarily in the interest of the minority shareholders. So it will be the duty of the investor really to look into these firms very carefully because before going in and really study in detail you know, where the loyalties lie, can they expect to see a return one day? I think that's, that's very true. You have to understand the reputation of the management, their track record, their qualifications, because in many cases you'll get a government uh, administrator in charge of a company who won't really know the business that well, but will be able to ensure loyalty and party discipline in the company, but as an investor that's not really what you're looking for. Mm, correct. In the end, you want to have a return on your investment. Yeah. Do you think countries really actively try to improve their governance system, their institutions, their courts, their legal structure, or is it more lip service? It varies from country to country. I think Mexico has really been making a big effort. A number of years ago, Brazil created the Novo Mercado, which, uh, for which you have to have a certain standard of corporate governance in order to, uh, to enter that. And right now, at the level of the governance of the country itself, the Brazilian judiciary is making big strides in uh, investigating corruption at Petrobras. So there are steps being taken, uh, but in some cases the uh, job is so big and the old structures are so strong and entrenched that it could take uh, decades, if not longer. India is another case we always talk about. you know such a big economy, a democracy. What do you think about India in terms of governance? Well, I've been investing in India since about 1990, so I've seen quite an evolution there. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I've seen, <clears throat> even in 1990, there were certain groups, family groups, that had a reputation for playing it straight. At that time, however, they were really in the minority. And what we hoped in those early days was that some companies, some ma company managements, would understand that playing the game straight would result in a much larger market cap, which would make everybody better off, rather than playing the game crooked, which would enrich a few people a little bit, but at the end of the day nothing would happen. And we saw during the late 90s the rise of the software groups, 
which did, for the most part, play the game straight and saw when were rewarded with tremendous market caps. So I think that corporate India, for the most part, at least large cap India, has actually learned that lesson and understands that, uh, that good governance can mean everybody benefits. That's a voice of hope for India, obviously. <laughs> but when you're in India, you obviously see there's still a lot to do. And there's probably not enough capital flowing in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the infrastructure is in dire need of investment. Probably firms are in dire need of investment. And many people are unemployed. Why is not more capital coming into India? India hasn't been a particularly capital-friendly environment. Uh, it's a democracy, which means that everybody's interests get voiced. And uh, it also means that, that um, leaders play for political advantage. And playing for political advantage has meant, in recent times, blocking things that both parties want in order to, for one party to get more advantage. For example, the goods and services tax, which would make uh, transit of goods across the country much more efficient, has been blocked. First, it was blocked by the BJP, just because it was a Congress idea. Now that the BJP is in power, it's being blocked by Congress, <laughs> which is very counterproductive. Similarly, the Land Acquisition Act, which would really help foreign direct investment come in, has also uh, been blocked. And of course, labor reform is also a very difficult subject in India. So there is foreign direct investment coming in, and Mr. Modi has been very, very uh, energetic about, it, uh, about looking for it. And indeed, he's had some progress. The big hope for India is that at the state level, competition engenders uh, changes in legislative uh, processes and changes in uh, the environment for, uh, for capital to come in, mm -hmm. which then creates a competitive environment so that one state will compete with another, like you see in America or Germany, for example, where the provinces compete for foreign investment and uh, a lot of money comes in. So there's hope, um, there's a long way to go. I think that uh, lots of people in India understand what they need to do. Demographically, there's a huge demographic dividend of a very young population, but equally that population has to find jobs. And the software industry won't be able to provide jobs for them. It'll have to be manufacturing and infrastructure. So with luck, uh, the forces of the market will uh, work such that the Indian states uh, make their areas attractive and that foreign capital can come in. And India, as you say, does need it. Another brick economy we always talk about is Russia. You know, now Russia is a very difficult territory lately. What do you think about Russia? Uh, governance in Russia is, uh, is not among the top okay. in, in emerging markets. Uh, it's really uh, very difficult. A lot of companies are strongly influenced, if not owned, by the government. Though those that are not uh, owned by the government still uh, are subject to quite a bit of government uh, influence. And this is a good example of conflicting interests. The government uh, f seems to go back and forth between a free market model and a command and control model. Although the communist uh, Soviet Union is no longer, a lot of the old habits are still there. In addition to which, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody to say that there's a level of corruption that's still pretty strong. So between uh, the government interest in uh, managing or micromanaging the economy, corruption, and then also just the fact that the Russian economy has not transitioned into a manufacturing economy, or for that matter, service-led, but is still a primary extractive economy, uh, conditions are quite difficult. There is hope that as long as China was growing quickly, Russia would be able to export oil, gas, nickel, uh, palladium, and platinum, and somehow take all of those export earnings and translate the, those into a, an industrialization. And there was some work going towards that a few years ago. But since the Ukraine situation and the sanctions and the collapse in the oil price, along with China slowing down, it looks very difficult uh, for Russia. And I, I get the impression that they haven't really decided on what kind of economic model they want going forwards. 
That translates into then uh, difficult conditions in terms of governance because companies then have to have to second guess what the government wants all the time. Very difficult. That sums it up perfectly, Gary. Many thanks for coming in. My pleasure, Tom.